Check one, check two. Everybody, good morning, welcome. Happy 4th of July to everyone. Yes? Before the announcements? We'll do the announcements first? Okay, all right. So before the intro, let's do a couple of announcements. How about that? Uh, first announcement slide, please. I can't remember what goes up there. Great job. I've got a few kudos I need to bring out this morning. Of course, probably every one of you sitting in here today, and even some of those people who are still gabbing out there deserve a kudo here and there. But I do want to say, first of all, to all of our veterans, would you please stand for just a moment? We have Don Cheryl coming in in uniform. We definitely want to see that. All of you who have served in our military, would you please stand for a great job? Kudos from us. Don, come up here before you sit down. Let everybody get a good look at you. That's okay. Come on up here. I know there's all kinds of uh, protocols, but, uh, you know, I, I'm just going to refer to you from now on as Captain Nemo. And a happy New Year. Thank you. Yeah, happy. Thank you for your service, of course, everybody. How about check it out? Isn't that, isn't that nice? I'm very patriotic today on Fourth of July, or Third of July, but close, Fourth weekend. Thank you so much. Got big, big plans for the years to come. Thank you. All right. You know, I don't know if this is saying too much, but I would just be impressed that the uniform still fits. You know, after so many. Okay. Okay. So anyway, other kudos I want to mention. Uh, he just walked down the hallway, but I'll mention that for a long time, at least three or four years, uh, Joe Williams has been taking the food that we've gathered here in the Narthex down to uh, networks. He's been delivering that. And uh, recently, actually I should say he took that baton from Bill Lewis. You know, Bill Lewis died about a week shy of his 93rd birthday, right? And then only about maybe six months or so before that, maybe a year before that, he gave it up and Joe took up that baton and every week Joe comes by here faithfully into the narthex and gathers up all the food on Wednesday and takes it down the networks and as soon as he leaves somebody comes and drops off more, right? And so uh, now Ann is uh, making a new relationship with networks and he has passed that baton off to her so she will now be taking that, uh, those goods down to networks during the week. And uh, nothing to say about that today? No? Okay. So anyway, and thank you for that, Joe. I just want to recognize you. That's three or four years of doing that just about every week. And when he was been out of town, I guess he found someone to cover for him. I want to say Gail might have been one of those people. So everybody, a good job to Joe for that. And also, have you noticed just how beautiful the front looks out there, the garden, the trees and all that? So we've got... Gail and Peggy and Ed, and who else do we have to thank for all that out there? Well, see, so you, you weren't expecting a quiz today, were you? It's okay. Whatever, whoever you are, we want to thank you all for a job well done. Let's move on to the next announcement, please. Okay, so this is last minute, but fun things don't really need a lot of announcements. On Tuesday night of this week, so day after tomorrow, 6 o'clock p.m., July the 5th, Nitro Zone, it's just a fun activity. It's, uh, we go down Jimmy Carter Boulevard towards Peachtree Industrial, and right at the corner of Jimmy Carter and Peachtree Industrial is the Nitro Zone. And for 30 bucks, you've got unlimited bowling and go-karts and games and stuff. And so um, I plan to take a group and go bowling, and the thing is the, we have to beat Ed. If Ed is able to make it, he is the, he is the ringer. You know, the, he's the guy who shows up and says, I'm not very good at bowling. And then he pulls out a bag and it's got like, <laughs> and the shoes, right? And then he beats all of us all the time. And so anyway, we'll meet there at about 6 o'clock p.m. It's 30 bucks, unlimited, and you can nosh on whatever you want to while you're there. Next, next slide, please. The tutoring continues. Uh, I don't know that any tutoring happened on the July 4th weekend. 
Maybe people would like to be a little bit independent of math for at least one weekend. But uh, we'll just we'll keep that going. And we know in the fall that that's going to be a very felt need as kids go back to school and begin to struggle once again with division and fractions and all kinds of things like that. As I like to say, down in the math sanctuary where Kirk uh, does his magic, it's the only place in the church where we allow division. <laughs> Next slide, please. I'm just prepping them for the follies, Kirk. Anne, you want to say something about this? You have to use the microphone. Must use the microphone. So um, if you have your own children, of course, you bring them to the church. If you don't, if you know anyone from your work or your, you know, your friends and family members, please share the words. So we're going to start August 10th, 5 to 6 o'clock. So if anybody asks, is there any fees involved? There's no fee. We're not charging any fees. However, the commitment and then one obligation, which is uh, the very last Sunday of each month, they are going to be here at 11 o'clock during service. Whether that's one child or 20 children, they are going to song. I'm mean, sing a song, whatever they've learned that I teach them. In their kids, their parents, their grandparents will be here at the church, which is our, you know, pure goal. And that group will perform for the Tucker Community Singers November the 19th, as well as our children's pageant in December. So, and if you'd like to help out, not necessarily teaching, but crowd control, or just, you know, come here, just have fun, and sing with them, sing with us, play instruments with us. So it's going to start August the 10th. Please, please share the words while you are praying for this um, new event. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. If you know of any children in your neighborhood, please invite them to come. Our class on Mary continues. We only have two weeks left, this Wednesday night and the following Wednesday night, and then the class will be concluded. Uh, many of you have come and have enjoyed that Bible study, and so we will continue to have that program, uh, other Bible studies starting in either August or September. I want to say August is about right. We will have at least two of those that will run along the same time as the children's program. And uh, we will announce those topics very, very soon. Next slide, please. Um, I don't know if you can see that very well or not. Did you know that there is a Disciples Men program and that they have a retreat every fall? So this year we'd like to get our men reactivated and involved in the, in the Disciples Men program throughout the state of Georgia. So on September the 9th and 10th, there will be a um, retreat at Camp Christian down, I forgot what town it's in, but it's near Macon. It's about, I don't know, 40 minutes outside of Macon. And uh, it's just a good old time. Uh, so I would encourage you men to think about it, put it on your calendar, and we'll, we'll talk about the announcements, the, re the registration, and so forth. Speaking of which, next slide please, there is a women's retreat, and it's a little bit fancier, ladies. I have to tell you, they... They go all the way to Epworth by the sea, and they stay for three days, or uh, anyway, Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday, which may not be three full days, but that's how they did it at Blockbuster, right? If you got it on Friday night, it was three days by Sunday morning. It didn't matter, okay? And so uh, this is going to be a much, uh, for some reason, the women always get it better. I don't know why, but they've got a, this nice one. I know we have a group of ladies that are planning to go. And guess who is the director of music at the program? Our minister of music and outreach, worship and outreach. So Anne will be there to lead the music as she has done before, and it's going to be a wonderful program. So uh, Diane Holiday, I think, is handling registrations, and I know that's going to be a good trip. It sounds like you guys are going to need one or two van loads to go down there. So if you haven't signed up for it, please consider it. And the best news is no church on Sunday. Well, I mean, you have church down there, but you don't have to listen to me. Next slide, please. That's it? All right, good. Now, I believe we are ready for the intro.
Good morning, and welcome to the First Christian Church of Atlanta. Welcome to the here in the uh, sanctuary, as well as uh, who have joined us online. Our opening hymn is number 720, O oh, Beautiful for Spacious Skies. <laughs> seated. On this July 4th weekend, as we celebrate our freedom, our liberty, our nation, we want to always remember the obligation that we have that with great liberty, if I may paraphrase Spider-Man slightly, with great liberty comes great responsibility. And one of those responsibilities is our commitment to our God, our commitment to our community, our commitment to our, our congregation, to our spiritual lives. So for today's pastoral prayer, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to read some verses from Psalm 33. I know this is going to sound very familiar, but as, we, as I read through this psalm, I encourage you to hear the words and let them echo in your, in your heart and Think of them as a prayer to God as well as a statement of our commitment. And of course, as usual, I will find a spot in which I will say in this moment of gathered worship, hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts. And at that time, I will pause and allow you a few moments to pray silently to God. And then we will rejoin with the Lord's Prayer. As we have enjoyed the freedom, the warmth, the comfort of this land, as we continue to move towards greater and greater parity and greater and greater justice between all peoples, let us remember that ultimately we are answerable to a higher power. Let us pray. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven he sees all humankind. From where he sits enthroned, he watches all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a vain hope for victory. And by its great might, it cannot save. Truly the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in steadfast love, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. 
He is our help and shield. Our heart is glad in Him because we trust in His holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us even as we hope in you. And in this moment of gathered worship, hear us as we pray from the silence of our own hearts. It is for your kingdom that we now pray, filled with your spirit and using the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Do we have any children this day? Now is the time for our offering and tithes and gifts to our Lord. Will the decor, will the deacons please come forward? word and we honor it through giving and using these gifts to further our mission in our church and community. Amen. You may be seated. We have come to the part of our service in which we meet about the Lord's table and we always want to repeat that if you are worshiping with us for the first time today we want you to know that you're welcome to partake at this table just like anyone else. We try to avoid using the word guest or visitor because that always sounds a little bit outside. We want you to know that you are one of us. We call you a first-time worshiper, and we welcome you to the Lord's table. We will take the Lord's Supper in two possible ways. In one way, the, each of the elders who are now putting on gloves and getting ready will come down with a tray of bread and a tray of the little cups 
And for those who desire, we'll come around from this side and take a piece of bread from Peggy and take a cup from Pete. And then for those others who prefer a more self-service, less contact method, we have these here, and they are at the table here with Chris, and you can come by and take one of those. If there's anyone who would prefer to stay where they are but would like to have one of these, when the deacons come around with the tray, just raise your hand, and they'll be glad to give you one. So on this Independence Day weekend, and especially tomorrow, the 4th of July, we pause to remember the men and women who made this country what it is through their sacrifice. We think back, of course, to the Founding Fathers and the War of Independence, and some may even want to think back to that second War of Independence, also known as the American Civil War. Throughout the centuries, many have served with their lives, and many have paid with their lives. We are grateful that we have many here with us today that we honored earlier who served with their lives but are still with us. The result is that our nation, our constitution, and the potential for life in America remains and is preserved. As we approach this table today, we know that we are remembering what Christ has done for us. He has delivered us from more than just earthly tyranny, but from the power of sin that holds our bodies and our minds. Because of his sacrifice, we can be free. And because of his resurrection, we can live forever in the freedom that he gives. It is in this meal that we remember that Jesus served with his life and also paid with his life. And because he rose from the dead, we are assured of an eternal victory. Let us now prepare with the words of institution. For I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. As we take this bread representing your life that was broken for us, we remember and celebrate your faithfulness to all who will receive it. We receive this bread in remembrance of you. Lord, as we drink this wine, we remember that you are the giver of life. You are forgiveness. You bring deep peace to our souls and your love flows within us. As we pour out this wine, we see your sacrifice poured out for us. We notice the depth of your goodness and the pain you suffered for us. Amen.
Our scripture this Sunday, Luke 9, 49, 50. <clears throat> John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop it because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him, for whoever is not against you is for you. The word of God for the people of God. generation from the plains to distant shore with the gifts that they were given were determined to leave more valiant battles fought together acts of conscience fought alone these are the seeds from which America has grown. Let them say of me, I was one who believed in sharing the blessings I've received. Let me know in my heart when my days are America, America, I gave my best to you. For those who think they have nothing to share, who fear in their hearts there is no hero there no each quiet act of dignity is that which fortifies the soul of a nation that never never dies never dies. Let them say of me, I was one who believed in sharing the blessings I've received. Let me know in my heart when my days are through. America, 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 America. 
America, I gave my best to you. All right. Well, I don't think I've ever heard that song before, but that was very inspiring, Ed. I appreciate that very much. Today, we continue on with a series of messages that have something to do with who we are and what we think about ourselves as a congregation and as part of our denomination, the Disciples of Christ. This is the fourth one, uh, entitled Cooperation. This is a title, this is a topic that I think Maybe churches don't talk about enough, they don't, we don't hear enough about. So uh, I think we could say just from the beginning that Christian churches, disciples of Christ, might be summarized as a New Testament movement to try to follow the form of faith and practice as we find there in the New Testament that really seeks to be united, uniting among all believers. Like the previous three messages, this message is about the way we practice our faith as a congregation and less about what we teach. In the, in the weeks to come, we'll talk more about what our specific doctrine is. Uh, you might want to turn that spotlight on. Let's see if it makes any difference. Other than blinding me, does that help you see me better? Okay, yeah, that's what it's for. <laughs> so uh, if you look at the Disciples of Christ website, you can see all kinds of information about our denomination about how we practice as a congregation but here are a few shall we say bullet points first we practice inclusion and unity at the Lord's table as I just mentioned you know a few minutes ago we welcome everyone to the Lord's table Christ welcomed everyone to the table and our denomination was kind of born in the environment in which some people were excluded because they didn't necessarily you know have the the right view of the Westminster Confession of Faith or something like that. Secondly, we practice what is called believer's baptism. Now this is something that came out of the Protestant Reformation and it has basically to do with we baptize people when they say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I want to give my life to his service. And then, you know, we baptize. We don't baptize infants. At the same time, we do uh, welcome people who were baptized at any stage in their life. If they believe that they are baptized, then we believe it too. Thirdly, we study the scriptures for ourselves. This is something that is kind of a lost art in churches today uh, because Bible study is something that is like so my grandparents' generation, right? So my parents' generation. But we do not simply say this is church doctrine, everybody fall in line and do what you will. We believe that we study the scriptures for ourselves. Even though some of us, you know, went to Bible college and seminary, that does not make us, you know, the only people that have the right to read the Bible. We believe that everyone reads the Bible with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They receive the word of God. And I actually believe you don't need any education at all, I mean, other than being able to read and write. Because people through all generations, at, at all levels of education or lack of education, have understood the gospel and have preached the gospel and have shared the gospel and most importantly, have lived the gospel. So it's not about education, but certainly it's not about a priesthood that controls the reading of scripture and it's not about experts who dictate to others what they should or should not believe. We certainly agree, for instance, we're having a Bible study over six weeks in which we've invited a Catholic minister to come in and to teach us what Catholics believe about Mary. I have a feeling that most of us will probably not change our views on Mary very much, but we certainly have enjoyed uh, learning from him what they believe and how they practice. And finally, as I have said many times, we are a movement for Christian unity. And everybody says that, of course. And a lot of times, Christian unity for a lot of people means when you become like us, then we'll be united. I think that we have, we have learned 
how to enjoy and appreciate diversity of opinion, diversity among us in all other aspects, and unity in diversity. We found that getting to know people who are different from ourselves is a way of, of being challenged in the way we understand God, the way we understand reality, and it's better when we have a variety of voices that are speaking. In fact, since this is the 4th of July weekend, remember that famous slogan of our founding fathers, right? E pluribus unum. Everybody knows what that means, right? It means eat more chicken. <laughs> Just checking to make sure you're listening, right? It means what? Out of many, one. And the old, the old metaphor, you know, was to refer to the United States as a melting pot. And the problem with that, me that metaphor is that in a melting pot, everything gets blended into one thing. So I prefer the metaphor of the salad bowl. So that the salad is one unit, but it has many different ingredients. And together, they make up a very delicious salad. And remember, it does not include grapes or strawberries. Very important. Mm. No. Pineapple, it doesn't belong on anything, <laughs> including earth. <laughs> okay. Now, I will admit that, that this is just a, a deficiency in myself. The inability to enjoy pineapple is my problem, not anybody else's. I admit that. So in future, gener in future messages, excuse me, we will talk about some more doctrinal issues and what we believe. But what I want to offer today, as I said already, is a concept that I believe needs a lot more attention. I'm not even sure that I've read this or seen this in other denominational resources or whatever. But this is the element of cooperation with other churches. So let me begin with some of the questions that Marilyn Bowman has formulated for us on this message. First of all, number one, how should we view other congregations in our vicinity? Okay, so all you got to do is leave this parking lot. You can go in any direction, this way, that way, that way, and you will pass many, many churches on your way home or to the grocery store or wherever. In fact, we could probably throw a rock and hit one. It wouldn't be that hard. Number two, are we competing with them for membership? Number three, how can we honor other faith communities while maintaining our own beliefs? I think that's a great question. We should just tattoo that on our arm somewhere. How can we honor other faith communities while maintaining our own beliefs? Next, you remember that phrase we just mentioned, e pluribus unum, unity and diversity? How can we accomplish unity and diversity? And fourthly or fifthly, if a person is a believer in Jesus as Lord and Savior, are they members of the church? Yes, the capital C church, right? Yes. If we believe in inclusion, as we discussed in the first message several weeks ago, if we value unity, as I talked about the second week, and if we believe that our movement is relevant for the 21st century, we must also recognize that we do not stand alone. We may be the representative congregation of the church, Christian Church's Disciples of Christ denomination in Tucker, Georgia, but we stand alongside with Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Presbyterians, etc. More importantly, all congregations that preach, that believe that Christ is the Son of God are all part of the universal church, according to the New Testament. In other words, we are not the only Christians in town. As obvious as it may seem, you know, like, I, I don't know, maybe you disagree with something I just said, but I didn't see a lot of no's in there. I'm just thinking that kind of there's a little bit of an agreement there. Lots of congregations maintain separation from one another, don't they? Disagreements about doctrines may be a cause of separation, but often separation is based on things like race or political views, style of worship, social class, 
church traditions. Like at our church, we do it this way. And your church does it that way. Or just plain denominational loyalty. One guy told me one time, and I, this, you're going to probably laugh at this, but I don't mean it to be funny. I'm not, making, I'm not ridiculing. But a guy told me once that he didn't want to worship here because we say the Lord's Prayer with our father rather than our mother or our father, mother, or our parent. And I said, well, I understand your point of view. But the problem is, if we start tampering with the words of the Lord's Prayer, it becomes distracting. You know, I believe that Father is simply a metaphor for, the, uh, for God. You know, the question is whether God has all the physical traits of a human being or not, if God is a father in the sense that we think of a human father, then wouldn't there be a mother? Wouldn't there be children? And that's just, just silliness. You know, it just kind of goes. So when we refer to God as father, we are using the word father metaphorically. It is perfectly okay in my book to refer to God as mother or to refer to God as parent. You will notice that in my language, I try, I, I don't always succeed in this, but I try to refer to God as God's self. God spoke to God, God's self, you know, and that seems a little bit awkward, doesn't it? But, but, you know, I don't think we should get hung up over the masculine and feminine pronouns. What we should do is remember that our faithfulness and, and dedication is to our creator. So I do my best not to get tripped up on those pronouns, but you know, I, even if we began the Lord's Prayer every week with our Father, it just sounds like an excuse, doesn't it? To say, well, I can't worship with you because you say the Lord's Prayer with our Father. But you see, that that's the thing. Cooperation is always sidetracked when people begin to assert their own personal preferences as to how things should be done. So again, things like race and political views, worship styles, social class, church tradition, or just plain old denominational loyalty keeps people from cooperating with one another. While getting along can be difficult because of such things, let me ask this question. Can it justify our feelings of distrust or our practice of non-cooperation? There is yet another reason many congregations do not cooperate with each other, and that's simply they compete with each other. They look at the community as competition. They look at new members or potential members as almost like customers to be won, almost like, I guess, Kroger and Publix might try to win customers over uh, to their side. So I don't know if this is due to our human nature, that we're all just competitive by nature, or maybe it's a reflection of our culture, our capitalism, our democracy, right? Because we are in a free enterprise system here. But whatever it is, it's not biblical. Can you imagine Jesus saying to his disciples before going, before returning to heaven, saying to his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples, but the prize goes to the church with the most members? Can you imagine him saying that? Or he might, or did he say, go and make disciples of all the world and make sure you steal sheep from everybody else's pasture? Regardless of how other congregations feel about interacting with the other churches in their communities, if we believe in unity, if we believe in inclusion, how can we justify non-cooperation? It amounts to saying we are neither inclusive nor united. Remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.13, and I quote, has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Obviously, he's hinting at divisions in churches where people don't cooperate because of loyalties that they have chosen from one group to the other. No. We claim to be in unity with all who believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Thus, you will find on the Disciples of Christ website the following statement, which I've read before. Is that big enough to be read? 
We honor our heritage as a movement for Christian unity by cooperating and partnering with other faith communities to work for bringing about wholeness, healing, and justice in the world. This is what it means to be ecumenical. Maybe you've heard this word before, ecumenical. One example is our cooperative work with the United Church of Christ in global ministries for the past 25 plus years and our full communion agreement with the United Church of Canada. Just a couple of examples. We also honor the heritage of Christian unity by staying together in covenant as a witness to the world that even when we disagree, we can still make room, welcoming all to the table as Christ has welcomed us. Our spiritual ancestors were fond of saying, unity, not uniformity. Our denominational ancestors also said, quote, we don't claim to be the only Christians, just Christians only. A lot of this, of course, is easier said than done. So I want to reemphasize the point of message two from a few weeks ago. Remember, there are two kinds of unity. One kind of unity says, come to our side and there will be unity. Be like us. The other uh, is is, as such. The one that I believe we advocate as disciples of Christ, and that is we pair unity with inclusion. Or again, remember the word university. What are the two words that university comes from? Unity and diversity, right? I'll tell you, I went to undergrad school in Bible college, and there was a lot of unity. But I went to graduate school at Emory, and there was a lot of diversity. And that was both very challenging, but also very interesting and very life-affirming. Today's scripture shows us something I think we really ought to take to heart. One of Jesus' disciples found a stranger doing their work, casting out demons in Jesus' name. But they didn't recognize him, and so what did they say? Stop. You're not one of us. But was he doing anything wrong? Is this not what happens between congregations? You don't worship like we do. You don't vote like we do. By the way, I'm, I'm of the opinion that the votes in this room go a lot of different directions, just, just so you know. We don't know you, therefore you are not to be trusted. To this, Jesus applies the same logic. Whoever is not against you is for you. It sounds almost like that old proverb, you know, from, I think, Lao Tzu. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. No, that's from Sun Tzu, right? That's the art of war. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. In any event, could it be that Jesus had other disciples than the 12? Oh, yeah. That's absolutely true. If we read the Gospels, we'll see that he sent, one time he sent out a group of 70 to go out and proclaim his message. So somehow the 12 felt like they were privileged. And Jesus said... I'm I'm paraphrasing. I have other disciples you don't know about. Evidently then, he had other disciples, and today he still has other disciples. Whoever is not against us is for us. If only we could take that to heart. Perhaps we get as confused as the, the disciples were. We think to ourselves, we are followers of Jesus We are the in crowd. How could this person who isn't one of us be part of the same team? Well, remember that quote from 1 Corinthians just a minute ago? Was Paul, you know, crucified for you and so forth? In that letter, Paul addressed many issues of division in a local church in the city of Corinth. And beginning from the get-go in chapter 1, he deals with factions in their congregations, And one of the specific issues that divided the Corinthian church is one that divides many Christians today. You know what that is? Speaking in tongues. 
His response to that issue is found in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. And it sounds a lot like Jesus' response to the disciples. Quote, Therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, Let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Paul admonished them to accept their differences as long as they were united around Christ. For Paul, the deciding factor was not speaking in tongues or not speaking in tongues. The deciding factor was, do you believe in Christ? Is Christ honored by this? Is Christ glorified by this? And to this point, if a person acknowledges Jesus as Lord, Messiah, and Son of God, we must accept them as brothers and sisters. It's not a choice, right? Regarding the other congregations in our community, you may have heard me say this before. We don't compete with other churches like McDonald's competes with Burger King. Now, sometimes I say that because it's true, and sometimes I say that because I need to remind myself that it needs to be true, right? Worship styles, traditions, and so on are mostly matters of preference. Splits and differences between denominations come out of very complex historical factors, mostly cultural and political and also theological issues. But if all groups honor Jesus as Lord, Savior, and Messiah, and Son of God, we must not demonize them because they are not like us. We must accept them as fellow believers. The question that I usually end sermons with is, what does it mean to join the church? The church is the body of Christ. That's what the New Testament teaches, right? And it refers to all believers in all places and in all times. If you are a believer, you already belong to the church. What we do here at First Christian Church of Atlanta is we simply invite you to become a member of this congregation so that you may unite with us in our service, in our programs, our activities, our missions, and so forth. But we are not an exclusive club. We admit or acknowledge that we are not the only church in town. We are simply a congregation that wants to please God and make a difference in our community. And as always, we invite you to be a part of what we are doing to serve God and our community in this location. Now, before we have our closing hymn, I want to call forward Peggy Denmark and Gail Parnell. I'd like to call, after, after they come, they're going to come here and, and kneel on these two benches. They are going to be ordained. They are both taking up the mantle of the eldership. And I'd like to call down anyone who has served as an elder, past or present, to come and lay hands on them as they kneel over here. Anyone and everyone who has served as an elder, please feel free to come. We come to this glad and solemn moment in which this congregation recognizes God's gift of elders to serve the church in Christ's community. All ministry is a gift from Jesus Christ, who is the chief minister, the great high priest of the entire people of God. Through the action of the Holy Spirit, God's ministry of reconciling, healing, teaching, and serving is the basis of every ministry that we do. While the whole people of God, through baptism, are commissioned to share in this servant ministry, the church from the very beginning have set apart certain people to be designated to serve in such ministries. Today, our new elders, Peggy Denmark and Gail Parnell, have come forward to be recognized. The church has, with prayer and deliberation, affirmed your call to the eldership of this congregation. Each of you has accepted this call as God's intention for your life. We therefore now proceed to ordain you to the office of elders. In light of your calling to this new responsibility, do you affirm your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and do you promise to follow him and seek to do 
and bear his will all the days of your life? If so, please respond with I do. Do you believe that the word of God in the Old and New Testaments discerned under the guidance of the Holy Spirit is the authority for faith and conduct of God's people? If so, respond with I do. Do you commit yourself to the well-being of the church and through God's grace fulfill a servant ministry of care and concern for all of the church's members? If so, respond with I do. All right, now the elders have placed their hands on them. Let us pray. Gracious God, the giver of every good and perfect gift, we thank you for raising up these elders in our midst to serve you and this congregation. By your grace, assist them in the building up of the church into the fullness of the stature of Jesus Christ. We thank you for uh, Gail and for Peggy and ask you to fill them with the good graces of your spirit that they may faithfully fulfill the ministry of Christ. Amen. I now ask the congregation to join the elders in affirming the elders' covenant. Reaffirming our faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, we gladly receive these elders as leaders in our life together. We covenant to support them with our prayers, encouragement, and, res with, sorry, and respect. We celebrate with thanksgiving the shared responsibilities for Christ's ministry, which is ours as the church. If all agree, please say amen. amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and in accordance with, my actions of this, with the actions of this congregation, I declare that you are now elders of this congregation. May grace and peace be yours in abundance and the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Amen. And I welcome our new elders to proceed to the back. I thank you for your service. I invite the rest of you to stand for our closing hymn which is God of our fathers. No, no, it is God of the ages, whose almighty hand. Again, we invite all who desire to become a part of this congregation. Have a blessed 4th of July weekend. Be safe. Take it easy with those firecrackers. Do your best to make sure that uh, you practice safe, what do you call it? Firecrackering. I don't know what you call it. <laughs> safe detonations. I like that. Okay. <laughs> and now with the closing prayer. Almighty God, you who rule all the peoples of the earth, inspire the minds of all women and men to whom you have committed the responsibility of government and leadership in the nations of the world. Give to them the vision of truth and justice, that by their counsel all nations and peoples may work together. Give to the people of our country zeal for justice and strength of forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Forgive our shortcomings as a nation. Purify our hearts to see the love and truth. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.